Hello, everybody. Um, so we're kind of uh, dealing with some technical issues. We're, we're missing some uh, panel members, but uh, we have Kevin Hayes here. Um, I am Alan Bailey and we have Jane Knoll. So why don't we go around and uh, do our bios and um, talk about how it relates to gaming. <laughs> you. <laughs> Kevin's laughing. Well, Kevin, you go first. I think you just volunteered. I will go first. I am a substitute. Uh, I am one of the people involved in the, the, the stuff that's been going on in the background for Come On Fluence. Uh, I am, I do not present myself as a gamer. I played D&D &D about, oh, 100 years ago, back when I had hair and uh, only a mustache. And, uh, and I watched and, and read and followed and, and, was able to uh, see the growth of the of, of games as as games. Uh, I mean, I saw the first electronic game, Pong. Oh my gosh, what a, what a challenge! Um, and the the growth of arcade gaming and the death of arcade gaming and and the stuff that's going on now. I watch with my stepkids, and they talk about games, and I sit and nod my head, and I'm impressed. <laughs> And yep. I do have a, a consultant here to my right, which is right over here, who will be feet. <laughs> <laughs> who will hands. help me uh, <laughs> sound at least reasonably intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jane. Hi, I'm Jane Noll from Dreamforge Magazine. Scott and I uh, published the magazine for now two years. Um, my background is in gaming um, from the late 80s through early 90s, I actually worked in computer games for what was um, a couple of different companies, but one of them at the time was called Dreamforge Entertainment. And that's really where we got the inspiration for a uh, magazine that we do. Um, I've always played games. I'm of age with Kevin, where I started with Pong. I was big in arcade games for many years. I've played tabletop, like role pit playing games um, since the... Um, We'll say late 70s. We'll call that late 70s. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, we still play regularly. We play a Pathfinder game regularly, and we just started a Shadowrun campaign recently. So we do still play a lot of RPGs. I play online games a little. I sort of um, got away from the computer games. But back in the day, I worked on things like we did a Captain Marvel, um, Spider-Man kind of thing um, back when the Marvel license was meaningless. Um, did, a lot of, um, did a lot of RPG type stuff. We were with a company called SSI at the time that was our publisher and they had the D&D license. So we did Strahd, um, Strahd's Possession and Menzo Baranzen were a couple of the popular ones. Uh, Sanitarium is probably one of the best known games that Dreamforge did. Um, and, it, and we still get fan queries about some of these games from 20 plus yeah. years ago. So yeah. I, yeah, I just remember, um, okay, well, let me start here first. Uh, my name is Alan Bailey. Um, I am the co-host, creator, and editor for a podcast called If This Goes On, Don't Panic, um, which we do have a co-host that covers games. I, I'm not that particular co-host. Um, oh, and we have a, Heidi. we have Heidi here. Hi, Heidi. Hello. We're just doing um, bios. Uh, I, I was in the middle of mine. I'll finish mine, and then we'll move on to you. Um, I have quite a history with all kinds of gaming. Um, I found, I, I grew up in a little town. Uh, I found a Dungeons and Dragons book randomly at like a comic book shop. And then I taught myself how to play it. And then I taught my, all my friends how to play it when I was 10 or 12. Um, I, be, I grew up with video games. My father had one of the very early Ataris where they were just like literally bricks shooting at each other. I remember playing that when I was four or five, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I, as I grew up, the video games got more and more complicated. I remember very well when Nintendo, the first Nintendo came out, uh, that was a huge deal. 
you know, I remember when PlayStation came out, huge deal, and Xbox and all of that. I mean, I can just track this stuff perfectly in my memory. Um, and also Commodore 64 was a, a big deal to me back in the day when I was like eight or something. Um, let's see. And as far as board gaming goes, uh, I've, I've always been a huge board gamer as well. Um, I had to take a long break from that uh, uh, just due to busyness, but I have finally started, gotten back into it and my kids are finally getting old enough to appreciate such things. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm bringing them in and I'm, uh, uh, I'm turning them into little gamers. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, Heidi? Well, um, <laughs> it was sort of last minute, but um, <laughs> I, started playing, I started playing D&D &D in 1981 when it was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Huh? Um, I've played various role-playing games, uh, Middle Earth role-playing, um, Mutants and Masterminds, uh, and stuff like that. More recently, because, you know, those are, you know, those are dedicated, like, hours of gaming. Um, I've gotten into tabletop games, and, uh, I have friends who demo them, and, and, uh, so I've accumulated a few, and, of course, that makes it kind of difficult at this time, but there are, like, three different places. There's BoardGameArena.com, there's Tabletop Simulator on the Steam platform. Mm -hmm. And then there's one other that I'm blanking on that was free and it wasn't that great. Pretty Game Arena is free. Um, I haven't done much playing there, but uh, you can, there are people, more, more often I've gamed on Tabletop Simulator, which is on the Steam platform. You can, um, there are people who have created simulations of tabletop games on there. Um, I want to say one of my favorite tabletop games is Fabled Fruit. Um, but anyway, all of that is, you know, those are, those are things that I've, I've played online with other people and using Discord, which is how I learned a lot about Discord. Yeah, Tabletop Simulator has been great through COVID because that's how we've done. Uh, Settlers of Catan is wonderful on there. And, um, uh, Dominion is what we played last night on there. It's, it's really, uh, there's some really good games on that. Yeah, and, and and I see in chat somebody put the other one was Tabletop Simulator. Mm -hmm. um, I, I typed that in there for you. Just say if anybody watching okay. um, is you. interested. <laughs> yeah, uh, and now we have a, another uh, uh, panelist here, Wen Spencer. Would you like to give your little bio and your relationship to games? Uh, you're on mute. Hi, I'm Wen Spencer. I live in Hawaii. I'm six hours off from you. I just woke up. Um, <laughs> I went to bed Morning. thinking last night, I have a panel at two o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow uh, and another one at three. And I forgot <laughs> to add this, subtract the six. And I feel so bad. But hi. Hi. Um, I play uh, all sorts of various games uh, online, and um, I started way back when we're doing Mucks and Moos, and uh, Apology Gravel, hi. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries, we're glad to have you here. Uh, when we just start, started, it was at first it was just Jane and I. I'm like, uh-oh, I think we're just going to be interviewing each other here. <laughs> um, so I'm glad to have you all here. Um, so um, what we're going to be talking about today is a look at how games and gaming have influenced sci-fi and fantasy and vice versa. So um, maybe take a little of a historical perspective here. When um, did you all first notice uh, a bleed from... Um, gaming into science fiction and fantasy because I, I think science and fiction and fantasy have pretty much always be present been present in gaming mm -hmm. so maybe let's reverse that a little bit well well the very first one i remember was like back in the 70s um i'm not sure which came first the comic book or the uh cartoon but you had the D, &D um people lost in um in a fantasy world who were actually players before they became lost 
um, Sandy Schreiber was uh, part of um, the comic book, uh, but I'm not sure if it was widely known outside of fandom. That, yeah, that d and I think existed in the basic before that movie and comic book. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, in, in video games, I remember Gauntlet very, very vividly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it was a kind of a fantasy. Uh, I don't even know if there was ever a, a crossover, but Tron was an interesting one, where I think yeah, the movie came Tron out. Game. Yeah, there yeah. was a Tron game, too. And then another, the game came out. Another really early one that I loved was called Dungeon Master. That was on like the Atari ST, and that was a great game. I and I, um, there were these text games like Gru, you know, and there was a Star Trek text text game on the on on the uh, mainframes. At least when I was in college, and I'm really dating myself, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you know, and then and then there was a game called Starfleet Battles, which was a tabletop game. So I think that science fiction and fantasy and gaming have been interwoven for many, many decades. But coming back to what Alan's saying about when did you notice that uh, science fiction and fantasy was affected by gaming, the first thing I really remember is the Dragonlance Chronicles being mm. the, the novels were very That's popular right. and they were based on the game as opposed to the game. Because the game being based on science fiction, I mean, Zork and, and there was a Hitchhiker's Guide text game too that were real early mm -hmm. on you know there's so many going that direction but coming back the other way there's it's a little harder to to pick those up early on well some of the some of the influence of games on on the the literature uh, a lot of speculation has been put out about uh, terry pratchett's first uh, first discworld novel uh the color of magic being uh, 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 the the script of the games that they, that he was playing at the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you read the book, you can see where that might be true. Yeah, yeah. One of the interesting trends I've been watching lately, it started maybe ten or fifteen years ago, is the isekai in anime and manga. Um, it's basically now dominating that entire genre, and it's you know, basically somebody from our world gets transported to a fantasy world and there's all the me game mechanics. You can pull up your stat window and look at what your stats are and you level up and, you know, it, but it's a fantasy world that really isn't supposed to be a game, but it does operate completely like a game. Yeah, I was at a panel for Dragon Con that was talking about that, that they, they, didn't talk about it in reference to anime. I wasn't aware of that, but they were talking about it um, as lit RPG or game RPG, where they actually would level up their characters and they use things like Pathfinder or um, D and D character sheets to actually track the character. And some of the books actually even give the character sheet in the book. Um, <laughs> that, that I was not aware of this as a genre until I'm listening to these guys talk about it, but. They had a half a dozen authors talking about uh, there's a lot of books out there like that. And I guess they first came to it from a Russian pub publisher um, that had the idea. And it's been um, pretty much mostly fantasy, but some cyberpunk kind of stuff like that, too. And it's very much like a portal fantasy concept where, you know, back in the day, the character would go into a fantasy world more like a DD and d kind of thing, like we were talking about there. But in these ones, they don't go to a D&D &D type world. They go to a video game world that has, like you said, the mechanics of the game as part of the world building. That's so interesting. Does anybody else have any more knowledge about that? I, I think I know one author who, who writes that, and I believe his last name is Penman. Um, and I, I'm, I'm totally blanking on his first name right now. Yeah, the, um, the names I have is Luke Pomenko, Tim, Tim Malenko. I'm not sure. He was Canadian. Um, Michael Chatfield and James Hunter were three of the names that I had that, that um, write that kind of fiction. And they each have a series of books out with that kind of thing. Um, and mostly, like I said, mostly fantasy, but some, some can be science fiction too. 
I, I want to say uh, one of the other ones that I know very, I don't know well, like personally, is like the Traveler games. There are a lot of books written in those universes. And then there's, uh, I oh, think, yeah. the Warhammer. Warhammer is mm. another big one Huge. where people are writing books in oh. this gaming universe. Well, the huge one is Fringeworthy, where basically the Stargate people stole vast amounts of information from the game and made the TV show and movie and such from that. And there were lawsuits because basically it was the Fringeworthy game um, with the portal and the whole um, Egyptian mythos and things like that um, lifted completely from the game. So I'm wondering, um, since most of us are creators here, how have the video games um, influenced your personal creations, whether that be like art for Jane uh, in the magazine or, or writing or, um, you know, just your creations? How, how has it influenced those? Oh, I, I'm working on a uh, <laughs> novel that's very much um, an easy guy, which is, you know, people who are dealing with a fantasy world where they had come from our world. Um, I'm having problems with it, so it's kind of on the back burner at the moment. And uh, I had my publisher get hold of me and wanted me to write a short story for an anthology on um, AI-driven tanks. And I'm like, tanks? Me? You want one from me? Okay, um, okay. And I came up with the short story where it's a tank kind of confusing reality with Minecraft. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I played lots of Minecraft. That's, that's funny. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jane, what about you? Um, I'd say mostly it's just the passion that, that comes from the gaming because when I'm doing the art, especially the art for the magazine, it's it's very much dictated by the the stories in the magazine. So it doesn't really have as much effect on my art um, as it just does. It's, it's the passion leading to even doing the magazine, you know, partly comes from my love of fantasy and an awful lot of my love of fantasy and, and, and science fiction too. It comes from from the games that I have grown up with and have played, you know, from childhood. Sure, Heidi. Um, well, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm not a writer. I'm sort of an artist, but I work mostly in jewelry. Um, but I want to say that things like um, role playing games have, you know, it's it's one of those it's one of those areas where it's a good problem solving and improv. Um, area and improv has really helped me a lot in my work and you know I work in IT um, but you know just just being able to think quickly um, which you all you don't in like you're not always called to do but think quickly and creatively about solving a problem um, I mean I, I think that informs many areas and I think gaming helps with that yeah, I, I think the, uh, the team experience of um, role playing also is something that's really valuable in real life. Right. I uh, watched a video. It was the um, training videos they made in World War II for their uh, spies that they were going to drop behind enemy lines. And they would basically have somebody talking in a bar and stumble into traps verbally. And my husband and I were sitting there going, these people should have played D&D. &D. <laughs> 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 this is so obviously easily sidestepped if you had just role played a good bit of my uh, time. Um, it, it just teaches you to think on the fly. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's something that, that we've done at, at our company, even our, our day job company. Um, we would have, uh, before COVID, a lot of Friday night game nights, and we would play games, like mostly board game kinds of things, um, 
because we played a lot of well, we played a lot of Catan that way too. But um, there's a Firefly board game that that's our favorite game. We just absolutely love it. But we play Risk or um, Walking Dead or um, any number of different card based games. Um, you know, we we just Secret Hitler is one of our favorites too. I mean, just a lot of the kinds of social interactive board game kind of situation is great for like getting people to get along and work together and play together. It's a wonderful experience. Kevin, would you like to add anything to this part? Are you, are you, well, <laughs> I, uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, the gaming and games don't dictate or, or overly influence the type of stuff that I do, but a, an awareness of the games is, is certainly important to, uh, to um, understand how character development and, uh, and the, the building of a character and, and throwing adverse conditions and situations and making the character figure their way out. Um, I know that uh, my step, uh, stepchild here, Jesse, is uh, an avid games player and a writer of fanfic and and uh, an artist and and I know what kind of influences it it has on them and and they give me a thumbs up there as I say this because they don't want to say anything. But <laughs> and dead. No. They said it was very interesting because when this was all getting started and 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 deciding that oh, yeah I can go ahead and stay on the panel as as uh, an extra an extra face or voice as needed mom went in and said Jesse do you want to do this and Jesse was doing some fan art of some of the games that they play and went okay sure <laughs> and came in here and sat so they've been listening and and saying yeah that sounds right yeah that sounds good <laughs> nice yeah I so, know Oh, go ahead. The, I'm sorry. The, the, the influences are not, not just even directly on, on the, the development of the, of the characters or the situations, but on the development of society. And that's where we pull all of this stuff from. The, 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 the notion of leveling up was something that didn't exist before the 1970s. The idea that you could increase your abilities and become better to the point of achieving a new experiential level. And that has become very much a part of the, the I hate to say pop culture, but pop culture. Yeah, like achievement unlocked. I mean, how yeah. many times, how many times do you say something like that, you know? Uh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. And that's all a game, right? That's interesting because that, that falls into the concept of gamifying systems mm -hmm. right. where like Fitbit I was just is say a that, gamified yeah. system, you know, mm -hmm. any of those kinds of things like you earn this badge or, you know, any of the kinds of things. There's an absolutely psychological aspect to um, gamified systems and getting people to, you know, rewarding people to keep them in that system. Yeah, I've seen that with several different social media platforms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a that's a technique. Um, I, I in my my day job, I'm what's called an instructional designer. So basically, I design curriculum, generally training curriculum for corporations, and uh, we do use gamification on a regular basis to try to get people to take you know take the courses, pay attention, um, and I have found that to be a, a fairly effective psychological tactic <laughs> to use to get people to actually want to do training. Uh, boring, you know, usually boring compliance stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, Speaking of somebody in the corporate, uh, in the corporate world, I have to <laughs> say, I appreciate what you do. And uh, thank God it's, it's usually done well enough that uh, I don't sit here for an hour on a Tuesday going, Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, oh, when I think sure. you were going to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's completely true, but I had been told at one point that the MO um, RPGs like um, War of Warcraft, World of Worldcraft, blah blah blah. I usually say wow, so say yeah. it the whole way out. Or Final Fantasy, where you have jobs that in a raid where one person is tank and one person is DPS or one person is a healer and that coming together with very little communication possible 
and working together as a team where each person knows what they're supposed to do in this complicated and yet remote um, thing is being transferred into things like hospitals where you have a specialist come in, do their job, and then get back out without having to have a, a lot of team building with the other people because they've been basically taking cues from the game where if you, you know, have a job and this is what it's supposed to do, you can, can come in to a completely new situation and interact with a team smoothly. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Drone, drone piloting would be another example of, of that kind of thing that, that the games have really had a huge effect on. Mm -hmm. And you, when the, the, the stuff that you just referenced, that's if, if you look at uh, Gordy Dixon and the, the whole Dorsai series, that, that forms a lot of the basis of, of the whole concept of, of Dorsai, that it was teams and teamwork, and let's do a breakdown into everybody's individual roles and what they do in this situation. So, so I'm wondering, how have you seen the influence of games play out in science fiction and fantasy as time has gone on? Because we already mentioned back in the Dragonlance tie-ins and that being maybe the first um, real huge example that we all saw with one influencing the other, but how has that played out over time um, in, in writing? I think it probably has, has like expanded things like when you see like Brandon Sanderson's magic systems, uh, something like that. And I would expect a lot of world building. Um, like when um, I, I watch a lot of d and type podcasts like Critical Role and High Rollers are a couple of my favorites. And those sh shows or series have inspired people to go and do their own world building. Um, they're, they're a lot about homebrew campaigns and people doing their own thing. And I would think that that's probably been having an effect on writers in world building, especially these people that are doing like the game RPGs. But I think it would hold true for like, I know Jane Linskold is, one of our, our inspirations from, for Dreamforge and one of our, um, our senior uh, advisors. And she has been playing games since college days. Um, she played with Chuck Gannon back then. Um, and they both talked about how games have influenced their careers and their writing. So I think that, that aspect of building a world and building a character um, has probably influenced many authors that that are writing today and will be influencing many writers, you know, in the future too. My very first book, Alien Taste, uh, is, has character, um, Ukiah Oregon, and he is a private detective in Pittsburgh and his partner is Max Bennett. Those two characters started out as a stalking the night fantastic characters um, that I played with Julia Eklar and some other people. And um, it was very fun. And I at first tried to salvage the game itself and then realized, no, that's not going to work. And uh, I threw everything away and came up with my own world building. But the characters, how they interacted and um, their personalities and everything came from a game. Um, and several of my characters I, in my early books, I lifted at out games because you know you live them, you breathe them, um, you get to know them. So you, it was easy to write them, even though I scrapped the game and came up with whole new world building for it. I was going to yeah. say, when that, that it makes your character that much more vivid when you have lived in their skin, yeah. which you know, writing the, the RPG and all of that. And I understand that idea of needing to change the structure because it just doesn't, like what works in an interactive experience isn't quite the same as um, like what you need for a dramatic structure in a story or a novel. Yeah, we certainly can't use the whole bit where we walk in and we're trying to clear a building and one person says, it's a gas leak and the other person says, it's a bomb threat. Yeah. <laughs> and like, which one is it? It's both. Just flee the building. 
Yeah, if the bomb goes off, imagine what it'll do to the gas leak. <laughs> to say that probably now for a lot of people their first um, encounter with building a character is building a character for a game and and, and and it's not just you know RPGs I mean it's also a character for you know an online game like World of Warcraft or or you know some first person shooter you know why are you there what is you know you, you, you kind of start thinking about you know well, who is this person you know, why are they there? Why are, what is their goal? I mean, and a lot of times the world does define that the, the gaming, the gaming, you know, has a goal. Um, but maybe there's an ultimate like five year plan, you know, in this, in this characters, you know, like, well, ultimately I want to have my own keep, you know, you know, something like that. But I think that it really does become, especially when you're younger and not thinking about writing the very first time you encounter character building. Um, going back to um, uh, some some examples of uh, gaming in in science fiction and fantasy, uh, two I can think of off the top of my head: The Expanse was originally a role playing game, mm -hmm. um, and also Cat Rambo's um, Exile series was uh, based on a role playing game. Actually, I believe it was based on um, uh, Mud, if I recall correctly. Okay. Uh, so if anybody else out there has any um, uh, examples like that, feel free to put them in the comments because I'd be really interested to see what those are. Well, somebody did say the Witcher series, which I, I'm not familiar oh, with, but yeah. I understand was also a, a comic book as well as, you know, the TV series and a game. It was a no There's a series of novels, too. Yes, I novels. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh -oh. I think the novels came first, sure, but I'm not sure on that. I believe so. I have to. I have to uh, check. But that I think out. it was the popularity of the game that really, because the game's been out for quite a while, and I think it was the popularity of the game that really led to the series. Yeah. An excellent series too. We really enjoyed that. Third. So, oh, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I couldn't make it through the first episode of The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> for as much as everybody loves the witcher i watched the witcher and i said well why are they doing this well that doesn't make any sense what why are they what that does, they wouldn't do that that just doesn't make sense it's not right out fight and go back and and no that's I just, yeah. <laughs> well then you need, you need to switch to the expanse because the expanse is awesome yeah i see I the watched. comment there it's the novels then the game then the series oh there we okay. go there we go so does anyone have any specific games that have influenced their work in particular? I uh, have been doing Final Fantasy oh, yes. game. And uh, I, I'm amazed that, of course, they have a staff and probably lots of resources, is how well they can expand. Um, I write series, and I know that it's really hard to see far in the future. And yet they have these storylines that, you know, take years to play out and are across different updates. And it's like, oh, this thing they said here matters here in this update. And then they expand it in this update. And I find it fascinating as a writer uh, to see them, how they, pick up threads and weave them in and drop them off. And uh, it makes me think about my own work because it's not often you get to see kind of real time people laying pieces. Um, you usually come to the work as a finished product and you don't quite see all of the, uh, the same things in the same way um, when you get to see it piecemeal. So you're making me think about narrative structure now, and, and I'm wondering if anyone has noticed um, how video games have influenced narrative structure over time. You know, um, mm -hmm. have they gotten longer or shorter or more episodic or, I don't know, you know, I mean, has anyone noticed anything about like that? I, I have the problem that I, I've got really bad eyes and I stopped 
reading almost everything but manga for the last few years until recently um, when I invested in a Kindle and it's like, oh, I can read again. Um, and the manga it is so overly overwhelmed by um, right now the Izekai. Uh, and it's very much the whole, the first episode is the character being dropped into the world. And then, yeah, it is kind of, it ha they have the long story to tell, but it's very much a go out to the dungeon, explore the dungeon, come back to town kind of um, cycle. I can't say I really noticed in stuff that I've read anything that would really pick up a narrative structure from, from a game. I would say it's more the other way around. The, the games are more influenced by um, the narrative structure of novels than than anything, because I think games used to be more short story, like where you would have, you know, um, here's your story and you're done. Now the games are bigger, more open-ended, and more um, uh, uh, more subplots, I guess you'd say, for, for an awful lot of the games. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. I wonder how yeah. you would do, you know, like an open world sandbox type of game like Fallout, for example. How, how would, how would you know, how would you do that? Or what's the relationship to that and the written narrative? I'm kind of just I've right just been instructed here. to say they're very good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do find that I think that one of the things that the games are benefiting from uh, when they go more toward a novel or short story where you have the narrative instead of just the open sandbox where there is no storyline kind of thing is the emotional resonance is to the point that people will overlook any other flaws and go, but the story, but the story. Um, so many times I run across players where the games they remember playing 20 or 30 years ago are the ones that made them cry at the end. Um, the emotional... Nodding head over here. There. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that one, of, one of the games that we worked on was called Sanitarium, and that's the one I commented in my bio there at the beginning. We still get a lot of comments from people on it, and it was an adventure game, um, and it did, was not open-ended. Open you were following very much a strict story structure and it was a very intense, dark story. Um, the probably coolest review we had on that was that Stephen King mentioned it in The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. He actually mentioned playing Sanitarium, because it's kind of a horror game, too. And that was, like, the biggest kick we got from, you know, uh, nice. it was story. Wow. But it was that emotional connection to the story, not big open-ended world that you could go wander around in. Right, right. Uh, we do have a question here about um, if anyone has any comments on Ready Player One, the book and the movie. I will say, uh, I know there was a bit of a uh, brouhaha about it uh, for a while. I mean, uh, positive and negative. Um, I personally found the book to be, you know, fun, but nothing really beyond that. I mean, there was nothing new or unusual about it that I hadn't read before, even in something as old as, you know, Snow Crash back in the early 90s, you know. Um, but I, I definitely thought it was fun. Does anybody else have any other opinions about uh, uh, Ready Player One? No, I have yet to see the movie or the book. I haven't, I haven't read either. I'm not familiar with I, I mean, I've heard of them. I haven't read or seen the movie. I highly recommend the book. The book was awesome. It was, uh, it, it is in engaging to me and enthralling the, the the world that they build and then the 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 background game that that uh, they in, incorporate into the world and if if you're a a child of the of the the 70s and 80s especially and um part of the 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 joy and the wonder of the book to me was seeing all of the things that i remember seeing as 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 time progressed, I didn't play the games, but I was aware of them. Uh, I know the references, and I know the 
the whole the whole premise and and wow it just blew me away and then when i saw the movie it had been a good two years since i had read the book and i went oh the movie's okay it's not quite what the book was then i went back and read the book and i went oh that movie didn't have anything to do with the book (laughs) (laughs) it did but the, the the things that were changed the things that were adjusted to fit into the 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 format of the the a two hour movie because it is not a two hour book. The, there is an incredible amount of detail. He goes through each step of the game that the main character has to play uh, in order to achieve the the levels unlocked, like you you know mm-hmm. the the achievement unlocked, the the leveling up, and all of that stuff. That it it just didn't it wasn't the same. They couldn't have done it the same as in the movie. Uh, as in the book, but I enjoyed them both, and uh, I would I would recommend the book over the movie. I would usually agree with that. Anytime there's a book made into a movie, <laughs> yeah, well, I would um, recommend the movie Jaws over the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, so, are there any other? Uh, uh, books that that really address video games in the same way i mean i know we've got like murray mentioned snow crash where they go into a virtual world and kind of live in the virtual world and then come back to the real world and they they sort of interact with each other but what what are some other more modern examples of that that we can not a modern example but one of the earlier examples was dream park that was niven and uh Steve Barnes, I think that was with Niven. It was somebody that wrote with Niven, but that was a very early on kind of like that. That was 80 or 81, something like that. Wow. That was a weird mix of, if I remember correctly, um, you're, you were in the game world only in that you were standing on a real island and they could like project things Kind yeah, it was like maybe a VR AR kind of thing. It's it's been since the '80s since I read it, so I really don't remember the the details of it. I remember because I was very early on in my D and Ding at that career, at that point in time, and you know I I remember really identifying with it or loving that aspect of it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're getting down to about five minutes here. Um, do we want to do? Um, uh, just a round of like final comments about video gaming and uh, science fiction and fantasy. Um, Jane, do you want to start? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I just, I expect that there's going to be a lot of in the future kind of stuff, a lot more uh, VR, AR kinds of things because that's so uh, much the, um, the take on it now, and when I'm hearing these people talk about game lit and, and, and stuff like that, and actually integrating games into it, to me, that's this generation's look at their childhood, just like D and D is a look at like my my young adulthood. I think that that the next generation of writers is going to have that look back into the video game world in a way that it, maybe this current generation of writers doesn't. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Uh, when? Um. I think with the huge um, Japanese influence that this is going to continue because the Isekai really has taken over uh, the whole uh, manga and anime. Um, When you look at what comes out each year, um, more than half of the storylines are the people transported into a fantasy role-playing game. Um, where it's, yes, it's a real world, but there's all the game mechanics, including screens that you can pop up and look at and see your character info. Um, so I think that, um, if nothing else, you're going to get any of the young authors who, um, uh, have any interaction with this kind of stuff will be doing it years from now, if not on a conscious level, maybe on a subconscious level. Uh, it kind of becomes part of your mindset, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, when I first started writing, everybody was like, 
oh, if you're going to write fantasy, you have to write a trilogy like Lord of the Rings because that was what was everybody's standard mm -hmm. of what fantasy was. Heidi? Um, I, a, a couple of things came to mind that I wanted to mention real quick. And um, one of the first things that I think is kind of a combination of a game and a book are the, um, I don't know if some people remember the choose your own ending books. Oh yeah. So, um, so there were those. Um, the other thing that um, incorporated a game in a very interesting way was Ender's Game. So, um, yeah. I, I want to say those were those were two very interesting influences or incorporations. I, I think that we're gonna. I mean, writing in in stories like Final Fantasy is a, is real writing, and I think, I think that uh, we're gonna have a lot of that crossover, and especially now, you know. Um, so, uh, I I don't. As long as it's an interesting, good story, I, I don't care where it comes from, really. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Cassandra Kahl is her name, is uh, someone who's been really writing a lot of horror. I think she just announced a new novella or, or novel with Tor just a couple days ago. But she's, her main job is as a video game writer. And then she, you know, I guess moonlights, if you will, as a novelist on the side. Um, you got to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Or, or we'd all be uh, authors, right? <laughs> Full time. Uh, Kevin, any last minute comments? Well, um, the I think that Heidi nailed that. I think there's a, a going, that there is and there can, will continue to be a lot of cross pollination that uh, some of the earlier games, D&D uh, &D set the tone and just following the the evolution of the, the whole game and gaming mentality and the development of, of more and more complicated stories and the influence of one story on another and and the development of, of the characters and the, the use of, of a story format from literature in your in your game, the, the use of the gaming format in your literature is just that's what makes this whole genre exciting and fun and and challenging all the way around. Lots of good comments. Yeah, I totally agree with everybody said. Um, I kind of wish we had gotten into board games a little bit more. We didn't even have a chance to touch on board games that much. Uh, that's something pretty interesting to think about too. But um, it is. We've got. Yeah, I like board games a lot. That's why I saw somebody was asking what games we played. So maybe in Discord after we can talk about games we play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got like 30 seconds left, if even that. So uh, we will be in Discord in the, what room is this? Moon Sanct Sanctuary? Sanctuary Moon. moon. Yeah. Sanctuary and Moon room after this. So uh, thanks for everybody um, for attending. Thanks to all the panelists and um, uh, appreciate your time. Good job, thanks. Alan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you.